Well, it's been a wonderful week at the Bartlett household. We had all three of our grandchildren together for several days, and uh, quite frankly, it's been a little bit of heaven on earth, and uh, most of it is due to grandma's generosity. Grandma and grandpa love having their grandkids around, but uh, it's equally fun to watch the kids enjoy each other. And uh, one day, Grandma planned an Easter egg hunt for the children, and they were booking it all through the house. Uh, you say, well, that sounds a little bit early. It's because we don't get to have our grandkids together all, all at once. And so we had an Easter egg hunt, and they were booking it all through the house, finding their Easter eggs and filling their basket. And right after, uh, Kate, our youngest two-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter, looked into her basket that was now full of her goodies. She looked up at her mother and said... Can we stay at this house, Mama? <laughs> I want to stay at this house. You see, generosity had captivated her heart. I got to thinking about that afterwards, and I realized that God has designed prayer to captivate our hearts by making us feel right at home in his presence. I can prove it to you. Watch the screen as I read for you day 75 from Pastor Snyder when he said, whether we pray for one day, 100 days, or 1,000 days, let's do it the way God wants us to. We must be convinced that Jesus, who is the mediator between God and us, is not unmoved by our troubles or our many weaknesses. Banish from your mind the idea that God is so far away and so wrapped up in his celestial glory that he doesn't understand what it's like for you to live your life. Then thank him that you are permitted, even commanded, to ask for what you want and need with boldness and reckless abandon. God welcomes you into his presence, but more than just welcoming you into his presence, he wants you to be captivated by his generosity and to feel right at home in the presence of your divine friend. I can prove it to you from the Bible, which is the only right place to prove it to you. It's in Hebrews chapter 4. It's taken from day 75 in our 100-day prayer series. It's Hebrews chapter 4, and I want to read for you verses 14 to 16 in the study that Pastor Snyder called, Ask with Confidence. No, he didn't write the sermon. It's taken directly from the text that he mentions, but uh, we are using some of his ideas. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. And as always, let me remind you that the reading of God's Word is more important than anything I have to say about it or anything you think about it. But in case you're missing my point, let me go one step further. The reading of God's Word is the most important thing that happens in this service on Sunday morning, barring nothing else. Listen to God. That includes, by the way, your worship and music. The reading of God's Word is more important than anything man ever has to say. It is God's Word that we need. It is the lamp unto our feet, the light unto our path. It is the bread that our soul craves. Hebrews 4, verse 14 to the end of the chapter. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near. You could say, let us then with confidence snuggle makes some of you uncomfortable, doesn't it? That's what it means. Snuggle up to the heart of God the Almighty. He is our Father and divine friend. Let us then with confidence draw near. Can you see my little two-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter? I'd like to stay in this place. Can you see yourself like a -a two-and-a-half-year-old child snuggling up to the heart of our God and saying, I like being here. This is a good place to be. Can I stay in your presence? Can I be in your house? 
And you can do it with confidence, the text says. We draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so what does it mean to ask with confidence? I want you to see number one in verse number 14 that you must hold firmly to your confession in Jesus, the Son of God. Notice what he refers, what he calls your salvation. It's a confession. Baptists are particularly known for their emphasis upon the teaching of Jesus that you must be born again. (laughs) A pastor used to preach regularly, you must be born again, and a lady went up to him and asked, why do you always tell people they must be born again? And he said, because you must be born again. You can't get to heaven without the new birth. But please understand that that terminology is just one way of uh, identifying what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It's an important experience. It's a vital experience. But it's the same thing that that, uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews is talking about here. Salvation is me confessing that Jesus is the Son of God and our great high priest. That's an interesting word that he uses, confession. The root word in the Greek means simply agreement. I agree with the statement that Jesus is the Son of God and that he is the great high priest of our salvation, meaning that he has secured our salvation by his work upon the cross. Confession must be made with the mouth. In our privatized world, we think that we have the right to keep our profession to ourselves, but we don't. Confession is a public acknowledgement and agreement of who Jesus Christ is. That's why Paul wrote to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you have made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Do you see that? You can't know Jesus and keep it to yourself. You have to confess him publicly to many witnesses. You're not afraid to say, Jesus is God and Jesus is Lord and he's my Savior. That's the confession Confession you have to make. You have to open your mouth and tell somebody that Jesus is. You see, it's doubtful that you have, have been born again until you've made that confession of Jesus Christ. It's a good word. You see what the word means? It means to be in agreement. I'm standing in agreement with Jesus and admitting that he is who he says he is and I am who he says I am. He goes on, Paul goes on, by the way, with Timothy, and he says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. Jesus himself made a good confession before Pontius Pilate. What was his confession? Pilate said, are you the man? Are you the king of the Jews? And he admitted, I am. What you say is true. He, is, he made that confession. That's the confession we make, by the way, the confession that he is the Son of God. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. No, I'm not going to talk about it in a moment. I'm going to talk about it now, according to my notes. <laughs> what is our confession? Jesus is the Son of God. That's the cornerstone of our salvation. When Jesus is referred to as the son of David, it's an emphasis upon his human ancestry. When he's called the son of God, it's an emphasis upon his divine origin. And our great high priest in this text is called Jesus the son of God. It's what the father announced the day that Jesus was baptized. I remember my baptism clearly to this day. I was baptized in the truly biblical way in a river. I'm kidding. I was baptized in the cold Tay River, T-A-Y-E, in in a rural village in New Brunswick. I took one step back a little too far, and it was a ledge, and I went under before the pastor intended to baptize me. So he dragged me back up to the ledge, and he said, let's start all over again. So effectively, I was baptized twice. Problem was, the first time I was baptized, and I stepped off the ledge, my mouth was wide open. (laughs) The Tay River didn't taste particularly good that day. But when I was baptized, as wonderful as it was, the heavens didn't open. We didn't hear any voice from heaven speaking. The day that Jesus Christ was baptized by John the Baptist, the heavens opened, the Father spoke and said, 
This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But that's not the only time that Jesus was declared to be the son of God. He went up into the Mount of Transfiguration and took Peter, James, and John with him. And while they were there, he was transfigured before their very eyes. And again, the father spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. It's the heart of what it means to be a Christian. You can be a Christian and be a Baptist. You can be a Christian and be a Methodist. You can be a Christian and be a Presbyterian. You can be a Christian and be a Roman Catholic. You can be a Christian and be all kinds of other things. You listen to me. You can't be a Christian without Jesus and making a confession that he is the son of God. I'm an ecumenical at heart. You know what that means? God has people across the globe in every situation, every denomination, every race that believe he is who he said he was, and they confess him as Savior and Lord of their life. So that's why Jesus said to, to his disciples, particularly to Peter, on that day recorded in Matthew chapter 16, do you remember they were standing at the base of a large outcropping of rocks, a small mountain in Caesarea Philippi, Jesus said to Peter, who do men say that I am? Peter gave him the answer. Then he said, but who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God who should come to us. That's the confession that Hebrews is talking about. Have you made that confession? But the text goes on to tell us not only is our confession about Jesus Christ as the son of God, he's divine in his origin, But this text says that we confess him as Jesus, our great high priest. He's the son of God who came to act in a priestly way to offer a sacrifice that would reconcile us to God. So what does he say about him? He's passed through the heavens. What does that mean? It's undoubtedly a reference to the Old Testament Jewish sacrificial system. Once a year, the great high priest of Israel on the high and holy day called Yom Kippur would take the blood of a sacrifice into the Holy of Holies and he'd sprinkle it on the mercy seat as a reminder and sacrifice for the people's sin. Once a year, he would do that. And so when that high priest would enter through the veil into the very presence of God, which was represented in the mercy seat, this text says Jesus didn't just pass through the curtain of, into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle in the wilderness. He has passed through the heavens into the very presence of God where he lives and reigns as our great high priest, always making intercession for us. You follow what he's saying? My confession this morning is simple. Jesus Christ is God who came in the flesh And he is the one who sacrificed himself as my great high priest and paid the penalty of my sin so that I could be reconciled to God. That's my confession. It's not mysterious. It's not difficult. It's quite plain for all the world to see. When the writer says that he passed through the heavens, he's emphasizing both his sacrifice and his exaltation. He's saying that this great high priest offered himself up as a sacrifice for our sins And then he now sits at the right hand of God Almighty, making intercession for us. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want to read it for you in Hebrews chapter 7. Listen to this. The writer goes on to explain the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, that is Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have a high priest who is holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. That's my confession this morning. 
So how can I ask God with confidence for the things that I need? I must hold firmly to the confession that Jesus is my mediator and he is my representative. Now let me just touch on this briefly before I move on. Notice the, what, the commandment that he makes. You've made a good confession, now hold tightly to it. Don't lose your grip. You know why that's important? Because as some people profess to advance in faith, they lose a grip on who Jesus Christ is, and they drift from him. You know you're in danger of drifting from Jesus and loosening your grip on him as you get older. So the focus of your life needs to be that as your mind weakens and your body wears out, you hold tightly to Jesus. The one thing, as long as you have your marbles in your brain, you're not going to ever do, is loosen your commitment to Jesus Christ as your Savior and as God who came in the flesh. I know what I'm talking about. I used to hear preachers say when I was a young pastor that fewer and fewer are able to make it across the finish line having fought the good fight and kept the faith and been faithful to Jesus. Now that I'm a little bit older myself, I'm just 53 years young. Isn't that young? Say that's young, Derek. That's so young. But I'm old enough to know now that the men and women whom I I esteemed in the faith, many of them have drifted from Jesus and broken the heart of God. You determine not to do that. If anything, you determine to lean harder into the heart of God. You determine to grip and firmly grip your confession of faith in Jesus Christ and not let up till the day you die. The word was used in Matthew chapter 21 and 26 by the religious leaders who were seeking to arrest Jesus. Matthew chapter 21, it says they wanted to lay hands on him. They wanted to grab him and put him in prison. Finally, in Matthew chapter 26, when they did arrest him, someone grabbed him by the arm and wasn't about to let go because those religious leaders were determined to put him to death to hang him on a cross and bury him in a grave and put an end to the foolishness of his confession. That's the idea. As firmly as an unbeliever is determined to deny Jesus, a believer is determined to confess Jesus all the days of his or her life. I can only ask God with confidence on the basis that I am standing firmly on the completed work of Jesus Christ. Let me show you number two that you must rest securely in the presence of Jesus, your sinless Savior. That's in verse number 15. If we're going to ask God with confidence for the things he's promised us, then we must hold firmly to our confession in Jesus, the Son of God, and we must rest securely in the presence of Jesus, our sinless Savior. That's in verse number 15. You see, drawing near to God draws out our true and real insecurities. He is holy and we are not. He is infinite and we are limited. He is flawless and we are broken. He is pure and we are impure. And so when the impure and broken and diseased humanity comes into the presence of Jesus, the very first thing that happens is your real insecurity and your guilt comes bubbling to the surface and you shrink in fear. But this word says, listen to me, Because of the work that Jesus Christ has done, you don't need to fear your weaknesses anymore. You don't need to hide your brokenness anymore. You can come boldly into the presence of Jesus with all of your limitations, all of your weaknesses. Why? Because the text says he sympathizes with our weaknesses. It's interesting that he used that term, weaknesses. It's a, it's a Greek word for diseases or limitations. So the Bible doesn't just describe sin as a rebellion against God's law, though it does that. It also describes it as a disease which has made us sick and incapable of being well on our own. We need the divine physician to intervene and to heal us. You see, sin can, even though we have been saved by grace, sin can continues as a disease to affect the way that we think. That's what sanctification is is about. He's changing us gradually from being unwell to being whole, to being shalom, to 
to being complete by his grace. So he sympathizes with us in our weakness. By the way, the word sympathize means to have compassion. Literally, listen to me, church family, literally it means to have the same feeling that somebody else is having right now. I think that is so cool. Jesus Christ sees my broken heart. He knows that I am devastated by the reality of my own stubbornness and sinfulness. And he doesn't look down his nose in judgment of me. His heart feels the separation that I feel from God at that moment. And so he is able to sympathize, to have compassion for me. He's the great high priest who feels the things that we feel. Notice how he frames his statement about Jesus in the text. He says specifically about Jesus, he, he is not unable to sympathize with us. He terms it in the negative to remind us of his exalted position, lest we should try to make Jesus like one of us. We're in danger of crossing a fine line when we try to convince people how much Jesus loves them to the point where we make him sound like just a man. He's not. He is the high and lifted up God who incarnated himself and came down. And because he's high and lifted up, you would would preclude that he couldn't understand how we feel, but that's not what the text says. Though he came down from heaven, he still can feel what we feel because he became one of us. Track with me, church family. You've got to work with me here on this because there are some people who talk about Jesus and say, uh, when you lied, Jesus also was tempted to lie. When you're tempted to lust, Jesus was tempted to lust. I've heard people say to homosexuals, Jesus has been tempted in the same temptation that you have. That's a bunch of baloney. That's a bunch of foolishness. That's not what this text is saying at all. This text is saying, though he was high and exalted, he came down and incarnated among us, and as he walked among us, he was tempted by sin. He was tempted by Satan. What is temptation? Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that it's an evil trying to rob us of our vital power. It's an evil temptation to doubt, defy, or escape from the will of God. So Jesus was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. you got to work on this and understand how important it is for you to see. Jesus did become a man, but he became a man without sin. How was he tempted? The Bible says he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. And the devil, this message is not about temptation, so I won't go into great detail, but basically Jesus was tempted to have his needs met apart from the word of God and the will of God and the promise of God his Father. Satan was alluring Jesus to turn stones into bread and to use his power selfishly and to do his own thing, which is the heart of his temptation. Jesus, go ahead. We both know you're God. You can do anything. What would be wrong with seeing the kingdoms of the world and seizing them now as your very own? Jesus knew that the heart of temptation is for mankind to accept the invitation to be God of his own destiny, Lord of his own life, master of his own condition. And temptation is to escape the will of God, the way of God, and the truth of God by doing our own thing. Do you follow me? Jesus knows what it feels like every time a human being is tempted to defy him or disobey him or disregard his will. And at the heart of every temptation that you face in your life, Jesus is there to be able to say, listen, Sean, I know exactly what you are about what you are being tempted to do right now. I've been there, and I want to tell you it's a disaster. If you take your life into your own hands, you will make a mess of it. Say to God, I am feeling tempted at this very moment. I want to succumb to the temptation, 
but I know that this really is about you being God of my life, you being Lord, of, and your word and your truth is the way that I have to walk my life. I'm going to do what you told me to do. In that, in that regard, Jesus understands completely. I'm really afraid of stripping this text from its significance. I don't want to do that. But Jesus is telling us, when you come into my presence, you don't have to worry that I'm going to shame you because you are tempted to live in a particular way or you have lived in a particular way. I want you to know that I have forgiven you. I have redeemed you. And the disease of sin still operating in your life can be overcome by my grace. That's the next point. That's the third point in the text. Let me show you. If we're going to ask with confidence, we have to rest securely in the presence of Jesus, our sinless Savior, who sympathizes with us in our weaknesses because he was tempted in every respect as we are yet without sin. And thirdly and lastly, we need to draw near to Jesus at his throne of grace in verse number 16. I sort of let the cat out of the bag when I was reading this text by telling you that this is the Bible's invitation for you to snuggle with God. Your single greatest need is to draw near to God. You were created for the purpose of walking with God. Enoch, the Bible says Enoch walked with God. Genesis 3 says that he walked in the cool of the garden, in the presence of Adam and Eve, who, by the way, hid themselves because they had sinned. The gospel is the restoration of the paradise of Eden. What is paradise? Not because there's a crystal clear river that flows through the middle of it. There are trees of life on either side. It's not par paradise. is because God dwells with us. We get to walk hand in hand with God. This text is saying, like my two-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter was intuitively smart enough to know this is a good place. I want to stay here. I need to be here in the presence of my God. And yet most of you are going to live isolated, lonely, independent lives. The whole while, your creator God and your divine friend desires to fill your life with a sense of his peace and rest no matter what happens. Do you get the drift? You're never alone. Even when you're all alone. Because Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's been a long, long time since I told you this, but every once in a while I have to remind you. My story started out in some dark ways. And as a teenager, I dreamed about ways that I could end my life. I wanted to finish it all. The one single truth that stopped me from doing it was Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. He has said, I will never, no, never, no, never forsake you. I'll never leave you alone. And my utter loneliness was transformed into a glorious friendship that every child of God should be able to experience in their life. The text says that you can come with confidence, with boldness, the word means speech that conceals nothing or passes over nothing. There's no double talk with, with, uh, with the child of God in God's presence. It means plainly, I can come telling God exactly what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling and why I am where I am. And the Bible says he welcomes you to come boldly with confidence into his very presence. That's why Acts chapter 4 and verse number 13 says, when they saw the boldness, that's the same word, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So Peter and John said everything that needed to be said to the religious leaders of the day, and they, they came with confidence. Do you know what this means, church family? You start talking to God from your heart about the things that trouble you because he gives you that freedom. And that's the place of healing when you begin talking honestly from your heart to God. But that would mean, wouldn't it? I'm off on a bit of a tangent, I know. That would mean that you have to start being honest with yourself. 
Most people aren't honest with God because they're not yet honest with themselves. This text says you speak plainly to God because you're coming to a throne of grace. Isn't it interesting that he frames it in that way? The place where Jesus is seated at the right hand of God is called a throne of God. Thrones are used for dispensing power, but in heaven they're used for dispensing the grace that we need to help us in time of need. Do you see what he says? You come freely into God's presence. You come boldly into God's presence. You kneel at the throne of grace. He's going to dispense to you the two things you need more than anything else. You know what your need is right now more than anything else? Church family, are you tracking with me this morning? I can't tell. That loss of one hour last night really did you in. You just have a glazed look this morning. You go home and have a nap. Maybe think about what I preached this morning. Listen to me. This text is telling us that your greatest need is not physical healing. And I'm all for praying for physical healing. Over the last couple of weeks, half a dozen times, I've knelt on my knees at a bedside of one of our members in the hospital, and I took them by the hand and prayed boldly that God would be kind to them and, and bring them back to stand on their feet. I think it's right to pray that way. But I always pray, but I'm not you, Lord. Only you know what is right. So give my brother and give my sister the strength to keep going in what you have ordered in their life today. So the two greatest needs that we have, the text says, are mercy and grace. And when we have mercy and grace, we have everything that we need. What does he say? We come boldly to the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, if you don't mind me pointing out, he's just described sinners as disease-ridden, limited beings who then, in my estimation, are continually in need. How often should we come to this throne of grace? Always, continually. And we need to pray. It's, it's funny. It, it's, it disturbs me deeply. I hear people pray all the time for a job, for healing, for more money, for, all, for a thousand different things. You seldom hear even in the evangelical church, a plead, plea for mercy from God. Your greatest need is mercy. Mercy is God not giving you what you do deserve. You know what it demonstrates? We don't know how needy we really are. If you knew how needy you really are, the first thing, the first words out of your mouth was, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. By the way, a prayer I often pray because Jesus taught us to pray that prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Why do I think I should go to heaven? I don't think I have a right to go to heaven. I don't think I deserve to stand in the presence of a holy God. What I can plead with him, though, is that he'd have mercy upon me and forgive me because of his son, Jesus Christ. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Having forgiven me my sin, now I need your strength to live as a Christian. That's grace. Grace is God's enablement to live the way he has commanded us to live. The two things you should put at the top of your prayer list are mercy and grace. You should pray for them first every day. And the more you pray for mercy and grace, the more your life will be transformed by mercy and grace from the God who loves you. Stop trying to figure your life life out from your perspective. Quit trying to fix yourself and let God do it by his mercy and his grace. So this is an invitation to draw near to the heart of God. This is God's bidding you to snuggle up to his heart in a relationship of love and friendship. And it's only possible through Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me, please? So Father, I pray for your mercy in the lives of your people. Even though we don't often recognize it to the degree that we should, we are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, as Jesus said to the church at Laodicea. But we show off as if by some means of our own we've accomplished great things in life. 
And we're learning, Lord, that we are dependent upon you. So I pray for your mercy in the life of your people. Please don't give us what we do deserve, for our sin surely deserves for us to be cast out of your presence. But I pray that you would have mercy upon us through Christ our Lord and forgive us our sin and teach us to walk in the light of your word and your truth and your spirit. Then, Lord, I pray for grace for every person in this room. May they see that you have not given us what we do deserve, but just the opposite, in fact. You have given us so much that we could not earn and we do not deserve by your grace. So you are the God of all grace. And I pray that you would pour out the good gifts that you promised from above upon the heart of every person sitting in this room this morning so that they, like my little granddaughter, will be able to say, I like being here in your presence, Lord, and I want to stay here. You said that you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Now help your people to see those blessings, to act upon them, and to enjoy them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.